I do have a disclaimer. And again, this is a pro-con debate. This is not working for some reason. You will hear alternative facts today. You will hear fake news. And you have to decide whether it's from me or for Dr. Nakami as we move forward. The literature on this can be summed up in three words. Wicked selection bias. And much of what we do is really case series, retrospective, not great data, but it really struck me in reviewing this topic more than most. So keep that in mind as we go through the topic. There's no doubt, as we've already heard, if an operation can be, formed, be performed safely, which is really the key, laparoscopically, then the patient recovers more quickly, there's less physiologic perturbation, everybody's happier. So that is a true statement and corroborated in uh, the papers that we're going to go through. But the selection bias really um, is comparing apples to oranges, and it, it doesn't really compare open surgery to laparoscopy as much as two different patient populations, one of which is appropriate for laparoscopy and one of which is not, and they undergo open surgery. I think the other key principle is that adhesiolysis is a high-risk undertaking, maybe higher than we appreciate, and we'll go through some of that data. We would all agree that a recognized enterotomy has significant morbidity, and an unrecognized lapar uh, enterotomy can have disastrous consequences. I do a lot of reoperative uh, surgery on my services, and this is one paper that I have my residents or fellows read before we do any of these cases. This is an elective uh, incisional hernia repair and they looked at the incidence of unplanned uh, bowel resection or enterotomy, so 1,124 elective hernia repairs. And then they found the incidence of un enterotomy was about 7%, which is consistent in the literature. And when you look at no bowel injury versus an enterotomy, you see that the incidence of post-op complications threefold higher, the need for reoperation within 30 days four times more likely, and the risk of enterocutaneous fistula is 10 times higher if you have an unplanned bowel resection or enterotomy. So whenever I sit at morning report and a resident said, we did a tough case yesterday, there is a small hole we made in the bowel, we repaired it, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. So at all costs, we want to avoid that enterotomy. This is an interesting paper out of the Netherlands that looked at a nomogram to predict the risk of bowel injury during adhesiolysis because this is really critical in deciding do I do this open or laparoscopically. And again, they found a 7% incidence of in inadvertent bowel injury and one-fifth were missed at the first operation. And this is also consistent in the literature. A third to a fifth of the enterotomies are not observed at the first operation. Bowel resection was required in two-thirds of those enterotomies and the mortality was four times higher in the patients who had bowel injury as opposed to those who did not. And all deaths were from missed enterotomies. So what they found using multivariate analysis is the independent predictors of bowel injury were the anatomic site of the operation, meaning midline, uh, going through an old midline incision or lower uh, GI surgery had higher risk, the number of previous laparotomies, the presence of a fistula, meaning you're doing a complicated operation, or again, the previous midline incision. And again, in their multivariate analysis, analysis, they go through this, and what I want to focus on is a number of previous laparotomies with zero as the reference point. The patient had one previous laparotomy, the odds ratio is 2.2 of a bowel injury, two or three, 10 times more likely, and greater than uh, four or greater, 15 times higher risk of an enterotomy. So again, when we talk about laparoscopy in this population, this is critical information. And um, obviously, other factors, site of the operation, again, going through the midline again, fistula surgery, and repeat laparotomy. So what they concluded, the most important predictor of unplanned enterotomy is the number of previous laparotomies. If you remember nothing else from my talk, remember this. And this puts Dr. Nakami on thin ice because he's going to take the laparoscopic side because as he goes through the papers, what you're going to see is, again, in a large review that was just done, no studies reported any objective criteria for patient allocation to the laparoscopic versus open group. 
They don't document the number of previous operations. And specifically, NISQIP does not include previous operations. So it's a great database, but the key piece of information that we want is not available in that database. So how would I summarize the literature? I could put up two dozen studies. I won't do that. I'll give you the summary statement from four of these because they're very consistent. Laparoscopic treatment of small bowel obstruction is recommended by experienced laparoscopic surgeons in selected patients. Laparoscopic adhesiolysis in small bowel obstruction is feasible, but only if performed by skilled surgeons in selected patients. Laparoscopy is safe and feasible in the management of small bowel obstruction in selected patients. And finally, laparoscopic adhesiolysis requires a specific skill set and may not be appropriate in all patients. What am I supposed to do with that, right? That really doesn't help us at all in figuring out how to decide whether to put the laparoscope in a patient who comes in with bowel obstruction. So can we glean more useful information from the literature? So first of all, how often do we attempt laparoscopic versus open adhesiolysis? And in tens of thousands of patients, and admittedly there's overlap, but the the key principle is that we do it in only about 15% of cases. So upfront, 85% of the cases on whom we do adhesiolysis are undergoing an open operation. The next obvious question is how often do we convert from laparoscopic to open adhesiolysis? And again, consistent in the literature, it's about 30%. And what was a little bit surprising to me, that hasn't changed in 20 years. So even though we've been doing this and doing it for a long time and hopefully we're getting better, that number is consistent and doesn't change with experience. So ultimately only 10% of patients who undergo operation for adhesiolysis have that done with a laparoscope. So there are, aren't many great studies looking at this, but this is one, even though the numbers are small, this is a, a pr propensity scored analysis from uh, Finland against Scandinavia where they did know the number of previous uh, procedures. And their opening comments, again, reiterate what we've talked about. As baseline differences have not been accounted for in these studies, it is likely that they show laparoscopy in too positive a light. And they also state unless selection bias is systemat systematically accounting for, laparoscopy overestimates the, the, the benefit. The papers overestimate the benefit of laparoscopy. And they had, again, propensity scored matched groups 25 in each group, 88% of the patients who underwent laparoscopy had zero or one operation, and 40% of the open cases had two or more operations. And they concluded with careful patient selection that laparoscopy was safe, but basically that meant no operations. That's a patient on whom you can consider doing it lapar laparoscopically, zero to one. So that was their uh, conclusion. So what can we use when we're looking at the patient and trying to decide, do I want to put in the laparoscope or should I not? And this is from uh, 2009. Um, the, the factors that seem to be consistent in the literature where you're likely to be successful is if the right lower quadrant is the cause of the adhesions, meaning an appendectomy, two or fewer previous abdominal procedures, a single adhesive band is consistent all, uh, over half the cases in which laparoscopy was successful it was a single band and the lack of massive bowel dilatation. But one of the important principles, if you need to convert from laparoscopy to open, do it before you are in trouble, meaning do it before you put the hole in the bowel. And this again is a key principle. And this is a study that looked at reason for conversion and emphasized the fact that why you convert is critically important. 537 patients underwent laparoscopy, an experienced group, this is out of Switzerland, small bowel injury in 5%, and that injury was missed a third of the time. And they came up with a concept of preemptive conversion versus reactive conversion, which makes a lot of sense. So preemptive, you're looking, the scope's in, and badly adhesed, and you back out before you get in trouble. Reactive conversion was the conversion that occurred after the enterotomy had already occurred and then target uh, incision for a resection we're really not emphasizing. And this is really, I think, a key observation. So if the procedure was completed uh, laparoscopically, 
complication rate is 8%. If they had to convert because of an enterotomy, then the complication rate is now 50%. Preemptive conversion, only 20%, laugh assisted 20%, and both of these are significantly less than the complication rate from reactive conversion. So interestingly, in uh, Switzerland, over the course of, um, can I go back, let's see. Can I go back one slide? Thanks. Over the course of the 20 years of the study, the frequency of laparoscopic adhesive lysis actually decreased from 54% to 32%. So this, the Swiss were less and less inclined to try to do this laparoscopically. So what do we do when we go to the ED, see a patient with small bowel obstruction? What is the right approach? And this is uh, accepted, for, but not in print yet, from the World Society of Emergency Surgery, 42 authors from all over the world. And based on the most uh, available, uh, the best evidence that we have, the conclusions are that the selection bias in these series allocated the less severe cases to laparoscopy. The reported bowel injury rate has a wide range, but it averages about 7%. And when simple operative treatment is required, a laparoscopic approach might improve the results for simple cases of adhesive small bowel obstruction. So this is the best available data that we have. So I think the answer in 90% of the cases, the safe thing is to do an open adhesive lysis. Thank you very much.